September 14th meeting of the City of Longmont Parks Recreation Advisory Board meeting. To order. Roll call, Aaron? Here. H? Here. Scott? Here. Yeah. Here. 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 And Thomas is not here. No, uh, Agenda. Any amendments, additions, or motions? I move to approve. I move to approve the agenda. Second. Great. All in favor? Okay. Passes. Uh, approval of previous month's minutes. <coughs> Any comments or amendments? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, number seven, page four. It says Spring Village Phase Two, but it was really Spring Village Two Phase Three. Very good. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 On item seven, Spring Gulch to phase three. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Nothing else? Okay. Motion to approve the minutes from the December 9th meeting. I'll make a motion. Okay. It is. Second. Okay, all in favor? I right. unanimous, great. Good. Um, next week, public is to be heard. Hi, I'm sure the public. Yeah, sure <laughs> uh, I'm me. Elizabeth Storm, up in Northwest Longmont near Matthews Lake. Okay, great. Uh, and you can go I, three or five minutes or whatever it is. What's that? Three or five, three minutes. Three minutes? Three minutes? So. Okay, who's trying to? Nobody's trying to. So I did submit an application to be on the Parks and Rec board beginning in January. And while I'm here, I figured I'd chat about some of the things that I've noticed in the myriad of parks that I visit with my kiddos, um, winter, spring, summer, and fall. Um, so, we play a lot of Flanders Neighborhood Park, which is, I'm curious, is that one of the he like one of the heaviest used parks in the city? Because it feels like it. Um, literally dawn to dusk, and the slide has been broken for at least six months. Um, I submitted a maintenance request back in March, and just in the past maybe month or so, a board has been covered up the slide, so kids can't go down it now and rip their pants or scrape their legs, um, which is the plastic slide that's been deteriorating. So I'm curious as to what the repair and replace timeline is on that park, because I know Thompson Park, which was older, but I played there with my kiddos before, seemed proficient enough. Um, and so I'm just curious about the Flanders Park. Again, I'm curious if that gets more use or less use or the same amount as Thompson. Um, and the Pirate Ship Park, also up there, now has the only usable slides um, also covered up by a little piece of wood. And he's nodding because he's like, I know I did that. So those are the parks that we use, you know, multiple times a week and that we're not the only ones. People come from Boulder, people come from all over the place to use them. Um, I won't start talking about parking. Um, that's not my, not my beef. Um, and then the Longmont Rec Center, we love. We use it for swim lessons with our just now two-year-old and our three-year-old we have to be online at 7.55 a.m. when that stuff opens and we're again with the aquatot and tarot classes, etc. So more swim instructors, please. And the water slide, which you can take your little ones down, has been closed. Um, the big purple one that you can actually put your kiddo sort of on your lap, assuming the lifeguards deem it safe, etc. So now that it's winter and all the awesome pools are closed and the splash pads, we love for them to open um, that slide in particular. Yeah, you'll get lots more if you select me for your board. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Your name again? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah. Hey, Do you mind if we, since she is here, and she's here, if we respond a little bit? I want to mind yeah. it. Well, this time, yeah. Tim Bertossi is our park superintendent, and he's going to be doing a, kind of a whole presentation on how we manage our parks, how we look at budgets, how we do that. But I also would like to say one of the things that you raised a good question is it our busiest park? I think every park is own staff, is always going to say their park is the busiest. Every member of their park is the busiest. I came from the county prior to this, and we have a trail with a head. You put a little counter there, you count all people going to eat ninety percent. Our parks have these porous boundaries, and we just have a hard time counting people. So we've been looking at some new technologies out there to really help us better understand our usage, where people are coming from. Feels kind of a little bit big brothers intrusive, but also help Timber know if we expect a park to last a certain amount of time, but we need double the use, 
maybe you have to start thinking about doing that a little bit sooner. So um, it is, again, like everything else, it's a subscription, it's a cost, but I think it has real value to the city to really know how our parks are getting used, who they're getting used by, where, as you mentioned, people coming from Boulder and other places. Yeah. I mean, when you do the neighborhood park, you say, well, it's supposed to be these people are coming to it, and you know that's not the case now. Ben, you want to say anything else about yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm Ben Wagner, and I'm a recreation law superintendent, so um, Rex said, um, swim lessons. Yes, we are constantly hiring. I yeah. mean, we don't stop hiring, and won't stop hiring. We will hire every person and train them ourselves. Yeah. So um, that is our intent, because yeah. we we know that right now we've reached a, uh, a ticket master status mm -hmm. for our swim lessons, that everything comes down to Day. That is not how we want it to be, but we are limited by the no we are working on. Um, I did not know the purple slide was closed for any reason. So That's I what a lovely dad told me, so I am just relaying the chit chat information that I get from parents, etc. I hadn't heard of that one. Usually, I didn't know that one. Okay, I'm David Bell, Director of Parks and Natural Resources. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so Tim Bertosti, I'm the Park Superintendent. Uh, so 2013-2014, the city passed the Parks and Maintenance Fee. Mm -hmm. We've had a huge workload to catch up on since then, and Flanders is on that list. So Dawson was also <laughs> Where? on that list. Right? <laughs> um, there's about five playgrounds that are in need of renewal. Yeah. Thompson and Roosevelt were at the head of that list yeah. for this year. So we're looking at probably... I don't want to commit to a time frame, but Flanders is on the list. There's five of them. Flanders Valley, Pratt Park, anything with a sand yeah. is on the list. Yeah. But what's unfortunate is Dawson was on that list at the start, and it got replaced. Yeah. And we're seeing that that park is starting, some of the amenities are starting to fail. It's only eight years old. Yeah. So, unfortunately, we're starting to see that some of our older playgrounds lasted about 20 to 25 years, and some of the newer, the newer playgrounds, unfortunately, last about 15 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Flanders, because it's so old, we can't get parts for it anymore. Yeah. I so looked at the manufacturer and was about to go yeah. and be like, can I buy this bottom extension no. how much? <laughs> so we've, we've hit a point where we either have to take out the slide, yeah. right, or we um, replace the whole playground. That's what we really want to do. Um, Dawson is not old. We can, we're going to order a slide for that. Yeah. And a little yeah. bit on sequence with Timber's presentation, I can really just fall in line with this, is that um, council really push us to start building some more parks too. But part of that agreement really was that we don't want to give up the work we have to do that Timber's really working on to, to renew new parks. Yeah. So now that we hire some new staff to do the construction of new parks, we have staff that really is focused on um, the renewal of our park system too, so that we don't lose that momentum that we've had. So we're, we're still behind, but um, Timber will talk a little more on how we're going to try to get there, and um, council's been really good about giving us the dollars to try to get the new parts built, but also giving us the resources to maintain what we have. Yeah. yeah, and we see your maintenance team and the guys cleaning the bathrooms and the garbage, so we love you guys, and we're just thrilled that like we have almost a park you know, within a mile of everyone's home. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you. Um, see the public. See the bird. We can move on to uh, old business. There is no old business. The first new business is Timber. Great. All right, so good evening, everybody. If you don't know, I'm, I'm Timber Tosti. I'm your report superintendent. So, a couple of years ago, David kind of challenged us with coming up with a way that we could assess our parks, figure out the condition rating of all of them, uh, and then be a really consistent way that we can set kind of like a menu, if you will, of what an A, B, C, and D level parks are. So we came up with a grading system of how we were going to do that. Um, it was probably a year ago, David, I was like, David, I think I got it. It's called Total Parks Health. It's a way of looking at <laughs> <laughs> the system as a system, right? It's a system of systems. It's not just the parks. It's budget constraints. It's usage levels. It's sustainability. It's, it's everything. How do we look at this collectively? And not only that, how do we inform the residents along where we're at in, in growing that system or maintaining that system? So we came up with this idea called Total Parks Health. 
Um, did you ever just start watching Ted Lasso after? Yeah, I did. I did. It was like, <laughs> you got to go watch Ted Lasso. <laughs> So we came up with this concept of Total Parts Health. Um, and what it is, it's, it's eight business functions, which are also tied to the long run indicators. So we're looking at automation, global initiatives, operation planning and projections, budget planning and finance management, development renewal and long range planning, reporting and data management, work management and staff culture development, and then condition rating and customer satisfaction. And that's all part of the total personal system. But it really is a system of systems. And Timber is a systems guy. Yeah, I am a systems guy. So uh, long range planning is kind of what I do. Um, so yeah, it all coming together, kind of fitting into this total personal system. Any question on this? Please feel free to ask me questions along the way. This is still very high level conceptual. Are you going to go through each of these series? Yes, yeah, so okay. That's what I'm going to do is go through each of these series. So the first one is condition rating and customer satisfaction. So we never really had a good way of rating our assets out there. What we really relied on is life cycle. So when was it installed? How long were you expecting it to last? Um, because of usage and other things, assets don't last as long as we hope they do. So Total Parts Health works to develop a shared understanding between internal and external stakeholders for service levels that are directly related to maintenance, budget, recreation program, and environmental stewardship. So what we did is parts and forestry operations along with the parts development team came together. We had a bunch of white paper or papers up here on the wall. And we're like, hey, how do we, how would you set a condition rating on a playground or a bed or turf? or all the amenities that we have out there in the park system. And everybody came together and what they established was a letter grading system of A, B, C, and D. So an A level is really that gold standard. Uh, if we had all the money in the world and all the people in the world, we can make it look like this. Uh, or it's brand new. And then from B, it steps it down a level. So this is a range we try to maintain all assets to it. Most assets decline very quickly have it out there, just use it a couple times and all of a sudden it can be. So this is really the, the level that we're hoping for in our neighborhood parks. Um, we're going to try to get to an A level in our community parks because those are really a shared asset with the community, right? It's it's there for everybody to use. We want it to be nice and safe for the whole community. We did never do the job right because again, we made that commitment. We're trying to do that, that at the beginning of the season. But the other ones are program them, I and mean, they're the ones that have the staff up in their use and trying to balance that. So it's tougher to recruit to continue that. So our goal is to try to start the season at that A. Yeah, so starting in A, as the season goes on, if it degrades a little bit, okay, but we have a plan in place to get it back up to an A. That's the whole part of this. There's a plan. We're making conscious decisions to get it back up to an A. Can you talk a little bit more about sure. D? I don't totally understand. Yep. Yeah. So a C level is an asset that really has been identified as needing or so Flanders Park, I would actually call Flanders Park getting close to a D, right? Oh, oh, yeah. So we've identified it in our asset renewal plan that it needs to be replaced, yes. but we haven't yet identified the funding mechanism to replace it. So that's really, we're slipping down to that D level, right? It's, it's starting to fail. So this is an asset that does not have adequate funding to maintain at the D level. However, through Total Park Self, we'll make a conscious decision to further the work. So when we look at Flanders, a couple of years from now, we have to redo Clark. Well, do we push Clark back a little bit and redo, you know, get all these playgrounds done? For us, it doesn't, it doesn't really, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but we want to provide the information to everybody to say, look, let's make a decision on it. We may not have all the funding available. We may not have all the people to do it, but let's make a conscious decision that we're going to move Flanders to, let's say, 2028. Or we're going to defer Clark a little bit, and we're going to do Flanders in 27, whatever it is. We want to have a mechanism to do this. And I, I think that's for me, Timber Telephone, so Tim, talk about the amenity piece. It's the piece that I can go back to the public and to council and then say, decision piece. If we want to have all be parts, Timber knows what it's going to cost. We have this amount, now we have to make some decisions. You, you don't get the side, you don't get the deserve with it. We, we can do a C level part, what we have. If you want these, it's going to cost this much. So. As we make budget decisions, we really go in and you have that shared idea. For me, it's just great to hear 
to Percy it said it's slipping to a D, and you agree. When I first got here, I'd ask people how it looks, and it's like, well, it's not scheduled for you over 20 years, so it's good. I talk to the park staff, and they say it's okay. I talk to rec staff, they say it's horrible. I talk to the neighbors and say, I love the flower beds, everything else. So there's just this, this discrepancy, and when people would tell me what the park looked like, it was like, what what are we trying to achieve and have that shared vision? I mean, we're, see the two of you agree, it's just kind of great for me to see where that comes from. The other part of this is customer satisfaction. So we do integrate our work management system, and then ServiceWorks is the call. You know, it's, if you have a complaint or something, you call into ServiceWorks. So we track those weekly. So we're looking for trends that are out there to see if we need to make service adjustments. We're getting a lot of calls about restroom cleaning. Well, what's going on with the restrooms? So we track those weekly in our leadership meeting, uh, and we want to be able to make quick adjustments on. Service levels. The other thing is that every two year customer satisfaction survey that the city does that we rely on pretty heavily. Uh, I think we get pretty good on restrooms, but it's just it's hard. To how, do you, how do you disseminate that customer satisfaction survey? Because I, I don't believe I have ever received one that I know of. No, I'm like the park. You would, you would answer. You would answer if you got it, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're random, aren't they? Yeah, they're random. It's, it goes out there. Oh, it's just everything. It's just everything. It's just everything. So, not that you're asking for ideas. No, I love it. But, okay, I've got this idea since my family was in her family stage that they're like to have a a core. Um, I In my head, it's mom core, but it's also dad core or, you know, grandma or you know, uh, babysitter for of people that are assigned to parks and their their parents and they're taking their kids out there and they're getting paid and they're not getting paid huge amounts but they're getting paid for their work and their job is to go to two or three parks a week and play on them and let you know how how it's doing like. Because you're already going to the park that often. And if you're like, hey, we get to go to Left Hand Park this week or whatever, you have a core. And I think, I mean, and often people with young children can use just a little bit of spending money. You know, it's like we're not talking huge amounts, but just a little bit of like, and it's, it might be even a stipend or that kind of thing, just a little bit of extra to make their lives more fun, or maybe they're paid in rec passes or something like that. But I think if you paid them with actual dineros, they would be more likely to actually hit those parks. And they see it from a different point of view because your kid's scratch on their butt is a whole different point of view than one of your guys going, it looks good, and they would. And they're looking at the dog poop, you know, and that kind of stuff, like all the stuff they need to. But the parents are seeing hey, there's, there's no sand underneath this swing, and, you know, I'm afraid my kid's going to die if they're on the swing, or they keep getting their hands pinched or something like that, you know? So, I think, so Jim can probably get to that in a little bit here. As we're starting to work with the staff, okay. one of the goals really is making this accessible. Nope, we haven't talked about paying people anything yet, but honestly, getting that wiki level of input so that you can start seeing those trends that, all right, overall, maybe it's looking good, but this demographic of parents are saying there's a, a challenge out there. So as Timber looks at sort of that big data piece of it, we start saying, is there something that we've been missing as part, like say, park staff that's looking at certain things, but the mom with kids, that's the goal at some point. Right now, he's just sort of engagement staff to start grading and scoring, see if we're on the same page. But once we get that bigger ability for people to put input, it gives Timber more data to help make those decisions. Yeah, what's nice when we spent last 10 years doing this, all the assets are mapped now. So you could you, know, you put a little QR code on that playground and somebody scans it and says, they pull up the condition rating, but how would you rate this playground? Well, it's a D or it's an A based on, so this is just an example of true. And his staff is saying, it's an A, I'm, I'm, I'll be like, why Why is the public saying we have a D and your staff saying you have an A? Okay, that's, that's a good idea too. So we went through, we, every asset in the city we came up with a condition rating for, um, so this is just an example of turf that walks through A, B, C, and D. So just for an A, uh, grass is in excellent health, vibrant and free from disease, pests, weeds, or damage. Grass cover is in excellent with no base or patchy areas. Grass is vibrant, colorful. So that, that would be an A. And then you got down there a D, right? That We don't want to see that. 
Um, so grass is in poor health, terrible coverage. There's drops everywhere. There's trip hazards. Uh, grass is sparse and thick. So we did this for every asset. So benches, trash cans, playgrounds, buildings. Each one of them has a condition rating. We haven't done them yet. We haven't gone out and actually rated everything yet. That'll be the goal for next year. Uh, but there is a rating for everything. Are they equal? Are they equal weight? Are they weighted equally? No, that's something we haven't gotten into yet. Is weighting, right? So right, because like you know, I don't care about the grass, but right, I might care about you know, <laughs> yeah. like I might care about the volleyball court or you know. So that would be something that would be really helpful for the public. Like, what's important for the public, right? Is it is it even weight the playgrounds heavier than the turf or the beds? Or you might you maybe send that information by how many people uh, right rate them. The, the place or place yeah. thing too. They sort of bring in more. Information who's coming, what what assets are using. So yeah, I think that's all right. The next uh, development renewal and long range planning. So the goal of asset renewal programs is to ensure that each asset within the park, trails, and nature are safe and functional. <coughs> uh, each asset that needs to be replaced or renewed will have funding identified a minimum of three years out. So we're trying to say that if, if the projects in the CIP. At three years out, we don't touch. They're funded, they're in there, they're good to go. Four to five years out, we may have a little bit of flex, and we might work on those a little bit. Uh, but the, really, the goal is to identify all the assets at least 10 years out. Okay, we might have funding identified at least 10 years out, but at least there's a plan, and we all know what the schedule is going to be for 10 years out. Is that what, uh, level one, level two? Is that what we're kind of talking about? Oh. Uh, um, <laughs> So level one, <laughs> level one, level two. So level twos are nice to have, right? Level one is an ongoing service. Really what we're talking about here for renewal is those don't even really fall into a level, right? They're just, you've identified that this asset needs to be renewed and we're making a conscious decision to say it's going to get reviewed here and we have X number of dollars in that five-year CIP plan. Um, so we know they're on our radar. So we, it probably technically is a level one because we've already we have the asset in play. Right. So if it's in play, we got to do something with it. It's just a funding mechanism, right? Right. Well, Harold's got to look at all that list. If it gets bumped to instead of five years to six years, it still gets funded at some point. Yeah, so like they may know it's going to drop down to that C level or D level. We have we can tell the public that it's funded the next year. But again, for me, it's. It's a little bit of a crystal ball. There should be, my piece is, there should be no surprises for Harold and Council. They know what's coming up renewal and they have the ability to adjust that. So, yeah, it's identifying any asset that's scheduled to be replaced but cannot be replaced in the of circumstances. It needs to be moved to the asset. Replaced. So, we're going to move it, right? So, Flanders. We know it needs to be re replaced, but there's a bunch of other assets that got to be replaced. It's just a conscious process to say, hey, we're going to move that over to 2027 because we have additional funding that we're expecting. Or there's not funding identified for the renewal plans. But this is how we're going to go through it. So we have a life cycle plan. So starting in October, really, we're going to run the asset uh, life cycle district regular report. And that'll show us every asset in the city that needs to be replaced from here until. 50 years out, whatever. We've got buildings that need to be removed from 50 years from now. So we're going to use that. So then, once the life cycle, would be, so we're going to run the life cycle report. So that's everything that we're expecting to need to be replaced. Then we're going to go out, we're going to use the condition rating tool that we developed to say, okay, maybe this bench doesn't need to be replaced next year. We can push it out another five years. So every asset in the park system is on that. We're then going to go out and do a condition rating on it. We're going to add the condition rating to our working management system, which will then allow us to do reporting on it, uh, heat mapping, whatever we need to do. Um, so from there, we're going to update the 10-year plan. So if we can't get in that five-year plan, we might push it to six, seven, eight years out. But it's there, and then it gets rolled in as we move through the CIP planning process. It, this might help. This is in this group. There's always, you know, we had that five-year planning window. And it's always feel like you can't have any input because we're already locked into that five-year plan. 
looking out 10 years gives us a little bit more flexibility and, and knowing that we can maybe make some of those adjustments and bring this group into those conversations a little bit too. Within that five year planning timeline, though, this kind of goes into the level one, level two request is there's master plan projects. We got to project the staffing needs. Some of those end up as level twos. We also got to do equipment needs. There's training needs that may be coming with that. So the synthetic fields out of Dry Creek, we have a lot of these synthetic fields. So there's staff training that's got to be involved with, with that. Um, there's also just ongoing operational budget needs that we have to consider. And then a new park is going to need to be renewed at some point. So we want to make sure that that data gets took over meadows, all these new parks we're building, all that data gets put in and there's life cycles inside of it. Um, and then that helps us do data-driven planning of community needs assessments. And then it all starts over again. We've got to take the 10-year plan, goes back in October, so we move forward. Any questions on this? Yes. And I'm not going to touch on it, but you touched briefly on the word sustainability conversation. Yep. Um, I have found in my time working on CIPs that it's often something that's not thought of until the very last minute. Like, okay. oh, we can't put low impact development or high efficiency lighting, or we want to put solar on the cell building and there's no money for it because no one thought about it. Yep. So I'm wondering if early on in some of the CIP processing you're going to engage with some sustainability folks or other folks at the city. Yeah, so that the global initiative I call them global initiatives because they I was wondering if that was what that was. Electrification, yeah. uh water wise landscape conversion, yeah, reduction of pesticides, those are all citywide initiatives, they're not just park. Global park, yeah. So that may be talking about later. Okay. It's the best term I need. Okay. When you come yeah. to the CIP, though, again, like yeah, it's right. early on in the process. Now those projects do go through the sustainability of the um, SES. Yes, that's yes. So I, this is hard to read, but just to highlight what this is. So through that planning process, so this is the five-year CIP that Stephanie has developed. Um, our, um, through um, what is Stephanie's team? Parks Development. Yeah. So these are all the projects they have. So there's master plan projects in there, there's renewal projects in there, there's new projects, new parks. So, um, they've identified that out for five years. And then from the operations side, what we do is we plan out all the people that we're going to need to support that, right? So Clover Meadows, Fox Meadows, or Clover Basin, Fox Meadows, Indo Gallo, they all need people to maintain them. So we've identified the people and the equipment that we're going to need to, to build those out over the next five years. And that's a piece of, like, I'm sorry, that Council and Harold has made. You know, it's, things always happen, budgets change, you get tight, but the commitment really is we don't want to build something we can't maintain it. And this, again, should be that idea there should be no surprises looking out. The timber, if, if we're outside of a new park on five years, Council already knows it's going to take X amount of staff, so it won't be a surprise. Anymore. So, for example, in 2025, are you getting your two FTEs? We did, yeah. So, starting next year, we're going to actually, it's actually, so this is. This is, is that for, for the, this is this for year. the next year. Oh, okay. So we did get, um, yeah, this is actually three. We didn't get Kaufman Street because Kaufman Street is not expected to be completed until the end of 2025. So we'll request a question. So it might be three there. On the uh, three for that one and three for 2025. Yeah. And Timber will talk about how Harold was able to make this happen. I mean, I, again, the only person. One, I'm sorry, Stephanie and Timber work a lot. Stephanie and Timber have been working this side by side and this stuff a lot. And then Harold has taken this commitment to doing the staffing series and Timber will get to how we manage from the funding. Here or later, if you have questions, we can talk about that too. But the biggest thing is there's no surprises, right? So there, next year, we're going to request three FTEs to maintain uh, Nino Gallo, um, Coffin Street expansion, and the Union Loop Trail. Right? That's what's on the schedule to get built. So. And then the following year, we're going to request two people, and we're going to request one person. And then hopefully, if we've kind of and really we, it's sandstone and dry creek holdouts that we're going to need additional people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Montgomery. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to identify that out all out, so there's no, no big surprises for that. And then there's just ongoing um, operational needs as well. So FTE positions, vehicles are really expensive, uh, contractor support, so additional restrooms. Um, so we're trying to project that out for the next five years. Right. Budget planning and finance management. So we really want to understand in that five-year plan the money we have available from 
multiple sources, and we can project out those projects that are going to fit into that budget. So we have several budgets that we can tap into. So there's the parks maintenance budget, which comes from the general fund. And that's there to maintain the parks, trails, and nature areas. We also oversee the municipal grounds maintenance budget, so that's things to maintain this building, the civic center, the library, um, really anything that's in the uh, safety and justice building, we do all that maintenance. And then we also oversee the arterial maintenance budget, which comes 100% out of the street fund of next year. Uh, so that's the right of ways that we're, we're responsible for maintaining. We also oversee the forestry maintenance budget, so that's out of the general fund as well. Uh, the forestry invasive species budget comes out of the tree mitigation fund. So if a developer comes in to cut down a large tree, there's a value to that tree. It's not so. City Forester has a, a matrix that he goes through. He, he can put a value on that tree, and then we, through that we get funds back from the developer that we use for EAB mitigation, any really any invasive species type stuff. Tree plantings um, come out of that fund. We also have the Parks Grants and Donations Fund. So there's a uh, Kanemoto family has a little bit of money that they give us every year for maintaining the Tower of Compassion. Uh, we also apply for grants periodically. So a big forestry grant we got uh, starting for next year we'll go into that account. Open space and parks maintenance. So we maintain some properties that were purchased with the open space fund. So open space does provide us with some funding to maintain those properties. And then Conservation Trust Fund, um, so this is through the state. Part of it is, so you will hear GOCO. So Great Outdoors Colorado is 50% of that. Uh, Conservation Trust is 40%, and then Colorado Parks and Wildlife contributes 10% to that. That's another funding mechanism that they get. And then the Parks and Green Maintenance Fund, which is the $2 fee that residents pay. So this is really uh, Stephanie and Jennifer and I. So knowing that we have all of that funding available, we can look at historically what we have got from all of those funds, and we can project out over the next 10 years what we're expecting from those. The green line is our typical funding that we receive from the parks. This is really the parks and greenway maintenance fee. Um, and you can see that after, what is it, 2025, we really start to develop a gap. So, sorry. Um, so you can see. So what we did for 2025 is the three new FTEs for. Um, I say, uh, so the new FTEs for Fox Meadows and Clover Basin are coming out of the parks and greenways. So we projected out if we have to add those positions for. Fox Meadows, Nino Gallows, Sandstone Phase 4, Dry Creek, the funds that we need for each of those. I would kind of run out of money. Um, that's probably another conversation for a different time. Yeah, so the but, blue is funds that you know about? Yeah. That are like secured? They're secured. And that's what, that's where Harold again this year, I've heard her calls the owner of there's no, gen, no, no new general fund positions. This group got a bunch of new positions, which people like, how did that happen? And that's where Harold really said that if we're get, bringing people in, people are known cost with their known cost, and that $2 that was coming to the Greenway Fund is a known piece. And tying them to other tax sources that fluctuate, if you get GOCO others that go up and down, and you, they're not consistent, um, he had a hard time looking at funding people out of that. So he really went ahead and took those part of Greenway maintenance fees, which are a, a number we know based on the number of people here under $2 that we can fund those with. So that's how we ended up with those those positions in place. Yeah, I mean, if uh, we didn't uh, have those people there taking care of things, we'd have to put up a fence and hire two more business exactly. officers to, to keep people out. So, but we, I mean, you've got to do something if you have this in the plan already. It, and, this, and this is where, as you get short, then, then the decisions have to be made. It will be another conversation. I don't want to get too far ahead of Harold. If you really think about it, there are other, this is where renewals come in. People, you can't just say, we're going to put off. This person can take off the next six months, we're going to bring them back in six months, but you can push a renewal out if you don't have the dollars. Um, so those are things we have to look at. We can talk to council saying, we know we have these renewals coming up, we're short, how do we fill that gap? Is it? So, so we'll find out from the, the elect, 
uh, from the new technology of showing, hey, we're we right. are getting just twice or three times the number of people on right. the platform. I mean, what are the different sources you could look to to make that discount? Um, so we can look at conservation trust funds. So we know there's some fluctuation in there, but we can spend that money on some of it goes to contracting. So you can shift. These are the decisions that we're trying to make, right? So if we know we need, let's say, $2 million in 2025, well, let's split 10% conservation trust, let's do 90% parks and greenway, let's do 10% somewhere else. We know the dollars that we have from each one of these, it's just allocating at which projects we need to put in. So that's not in that graph already? Not in this one. There's okay. another one. Okay. <laughs> it's like we were at the the conservation trust is one that the city had kind of made a commitment that those dollars are going to go to finishing the greenways first. So that's why they're not really shown there. Those are committed to the greenways. But once those greenways get done, this board, years before Trevor and I are here, and other councils really said that um, once the greenways get done, those can be up for breakfast. Rec could use those. The library can use those. The museum could use those. So I think it's be a very, again, deliberate conversation. How do we fill these gaps? What does the library need? What does the other areas need? And I'll just say it, you know, we have to, is $2 enough on that utility bill? So that's probably the other way that we have to look at it. Reporting and data management. So how are we doing and are we staying on track? So how do we inform the public of progress? Are we doing things equitably across the community? Put Placer in there, we've talked a lot about that. So Placer is a software that tracks cell phone usage. Doesn't track like who you are or demographics, but it shows where you've been. So we can see, hey, is Flanders really getting heavily used compared to, let's say, Thompson Park? And are people coming in from around the city to Flanders to use that park? So we, we're looking at that tool, um, but there's all kinds of data out there now. So we've got long run indicators that we're trying to, we want to link our parks information to long run indicators so we can track where we're going. We get a, we're doing daily reporting now, weekly reporting on things like camp cleanups, abandoned property. Uh, we've got GIS mapping now, so we've, this is Roosevelt Park, all the lights in Roosevelt. So you could, you know, if the playground's in there, you could go in and do a condition rating on that playground. It's, it's all mapped now. Uh, we're also getting a lot of national wide data. So the tree canopy assessment is a big one that Boulder County is trying to get a handle on. But really, that data is coming from um, national level satellite imagery. So, who's that? Yeah, we have 280. Yeah, people thought it's just crazy. I can look at it in ocean lighting. Yeah, so that's another thing. Okay, we've got 280 lights at Roosevelt that we need to put out to create LED lighting. It's another renewal project. Where does it fit in? Uh, work management, staff, cultural development. So, work management, life cycle planning uh, should feed all of the data. So, this are amenities that are out there are mapped. We've got condition ratings on. That's the decision that we're trying to make. Uh, integration of real budget and time tracking in the future. Um, are we developing staff to meet community expectations? You know, do we have the adequate staffing levels or expertise out there to do? level of maintenance that we're expecting. We are really trying to create a learning environment. So we're going to reevaluate our, our monthly training program that we have established currently. We want to develop an internal skill-based training program. So the forestry department has a really good, they have standards and it's a profession. So they've got really good standards in place on if you're an arborist one or senior arborist, kind of the just what you get trained on, right? And a checklist that you're qualified to so on the park side, on the technician side, we don't really have that, so we got to build it. That's going to be a goal for next year. And then we want a clear understanding at all levels in the organization of what our maintenance expectations are. So that, that really goes in that A, B, and C, D level of service. And then we really want to be the leader of Boulder County in the front range on sustainable maintenance practices. It's something we're, we, we think we're really good at and we want to share with everybody. Um, We've done a, a ton of work out there, we've made some mistakes, and we've learned a lot, so we're trying to be, everybody's like, well, what's Boulder doing? We want people to say, what's Longmont? 
Um, this picture just highlights a little bit of what our technicians, so this is Roosevelt Park, all the things that they really need to look at when they go out there on a daily basis. So irrigation, is the tree okay? Is, are the sidewalks cracked? Do we need to remove snow? The lighting, is all the lighting okay? Are the restrooms good? So they've got a lot to look at, but a lot of that really is integrated with our work management system. Um, so they shouldn't have to make a ton of choices, but there's just a lot to look at. Um, get, get on that, I stopped making excuses for staff. Those are the things you talked about, maybe the bottom part piece, where they're going out, they have this whole thing to look at, but honestly, when they go out there most times, it's because a pump's down, or there's a head broken. So they kind of get a little bit of tunnel vision going in, and they're looking for that one they fix. But they're supposed to be looking at all that, and even their lens for the playground may be different than the mom who's getting their kids pants ripped on the slide. Um, I'll tell you, I've gone out with plant, plant people and playground people and rec people, and they see the park totally different. Uh, I mean, my weeds got, guys all they see is weeds everywhere. The rec guys see yellow spots in the grass, and the playground people are like, the "Kids going to get his head stuck in this, and it's going to be a lawsuit." Um, they, they don't see anything. The same as it's a totally like we went to separate parks. I'm to sound like a broken record, but that's what I do. Uh, sustainable maintenance practices include electric uh, lawn yeah, and all of that. Wrong. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when we, f 10 years ago, we developed kind of how a plan on how we're going to get, we didn't have a work management system, so we were. How do we get all of that stuff on the previous slide into a work management system, a digital system, so that we're generating work orders so that staff isn't missing things and we're actually able to report on things? Um, so we got all the assets identified. We've got life cycle built into our work management system. And what's great this year, we got uh, the condition rating is built. We, have, we know what we're going to rate things on. We've got to go out and rate things. And then that will help us do the data driven need assessment. So got a whole bunch of assets that are out there as a D, call for beds, this goes into that. We're just going to leave the beds and call them a D, and that's, we all know that as a community, great. Uh, but that really all feeds into total park cycle. It's just the way that we make decisions. Automation, so we got to look towards the future. We're already starting to see it come in. Um, we've automated quite a bit, few things. So I talked about our work management system. Our irrigation system is completely automated now. We are just started this year doing a web-based system. So we want, our old system communicated through radio frequencies. So you'd have to send out a radio call and come back. It was really inefficient. The new system is web-based. So we just go on and we program it. And it's digital and it just sends it. Uh, we got 218 clocks to do though. So it's going to take us a little time to uh, pump station monitoring, so we have these very large raw water pump stations that are really expensive, so anywhere between 500,000 of million dollar pump stations. All of, all of those are monitored now remotely, and it comes in and we get email notifications if something's wrong. Uh, AVL is our GPS tracking system for all of our trucks, so we can tell where people are, we do efficient routing. And then start, just this year, we've got our new cameras. So we've got 32 cameras now at the park system. Uh, they're not just monitoring for vandalism, right? If somebody calls in and says, hey, Tim, we got a full trash can at Collier Park, I can go on to the camera, zoom in, the guy's already got it, or the guy's already got it, it's, it's not. Uh, how, well, we got to understand how AI is going to impact the industry. We want to develop a digital twin so we can kind of run through testing and see how things are going. The big thing is we want to keep people still involved in the automation process. So what training are they going to need? Um, I think Rush Creation is getting a turf tank. Maybe. They're working on it. Okay. <laughs> so turf tank is a line striping robot. Um, they advertise that doing manual marking takes two people, two hours, about five gallons of paint. Or with a turf tank, it takes a person, uh, and then it takes about five minutes to strike it with a half a gallon. It's just more efficient. Uh, Scythe Robotics is a local company. Uh, they're building this really cool new, it's a robotic mower. Um, I keep seeing people on them though, so it's not truly autonomous. I don't know quite what's going on with them, but really cool technology coming out. And then the top picture, uh, the open space team just did spraying with a drone out at the range. 
That was a project that would have taken probably a week to two weeks. The people on ATVs, I personally have a friend in Boulder County killed on ATV doing wind spraying. Um, backpacks and two weeks of work out there with people in that condition. This was a half day. Yeah. Where did you say it was spent? Out at the archery in the old landfill that's way out east where the new trails would go. So oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Kind of a five and a half days. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was really super steep. You can't get equipment out there very easily. It's really nice. nice. Approach the site about doing it. Yeah, day. I've been there a couple of times. Yeah. They were, they're not there quite yet. What be? Yeah. What, I, 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 the piece we got on Tipper actually just so you know Tipper had this really early on. He had another group out here that was Longmont. Oh, um, we were actually left-hand robotics. Yeah, left-hand robotics was doing it too. So Tipper is really he's been doing this for quite a while. But we've gone out. I think that because of the way to make these effective is they're they're mowing twenty four seven basically, which we really need our contractors to be the ones that are using these things that they can just unload them, yep. do ours as part of the system, then go to schools and do them, and then go to because. You know, they're, they're electric and quiet and they can run all the time. But I think you get your money back from them by them going as much as they can. So, that technology, I, probably in the next five years, we're going to see robotic mowing. That's, that's getting something like more or something to do with that. Yeah. Right. On it, on it. Is there uh, any incentive like a grant to have them? Not that more, but it's a good idea. Because I'm just thinking that, that they would make that happen sooner than later if they had the proof that this right. would work for them. Wards has been working with Scythe Robotics. I know they have a contract, but I've seen somebody write it. They just, for, I don't know if it's safety, they're just really apprehensive. But it might be, to, yeah, we're just worried that some dog will get it in right. there to it. But they are electric, so that's, that's good. I want to see a vacuum on the front of it. A vacuum? Yeah. So, let's see, you know, because this isn't your thing, but you're going to tell me what you want, right? Oh, yeah. I want a vacuum on it because it you know, would suck up the trash oh, before yeah. they hit it and spread it. <laughs> and also <laughs> suck up the weed seeds. Oh, yeah. Yeah, before they get hit and spread. So, yeah. Oh, and maybe um, a bun back 2000 would suck up the bunnies and then put them in the <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> well, some ground there. All right, global initiatives. So, electrification of our fleet. So, the city's got a 10% goal annual until complete. Um, so, if anybody's interested, that picture on the right is our yard out here. So, we've got five new EV, actually, sorry, 10 new EV charging stations out back. Um, they're level twos. Um, so, those just went in a month ago. They're not on yet, but they will be. So we're getting there. Um, the big one that we're trying to wrap right around, we just found out, is Regulation 29. So that's the Air Emission Reduction Act. Um, so as of June 1, so starting next year, June 1st, the city and its contractors will not be able to use anything between June 1 and August 31st that is under 10 horsepower that's not electric. Um, we're ready for that. Yeah. We've been converting to electric. So that's like Line trimmers, backpack blowers, chainsaws, all of our chains, all that stuff we electric five years ago. We actually had a bunch of plans for it. So we're doing good there. Our contractors are not, so they're going to have to work with them over the winter to get ready for that. But there's a bunch of state grants available to get them converted. So, yeah, it's the states saying, yeah. nope, got to do this. 7KW, the yeah. piece of equipment isn't, isn't working. And the, um, any state uh, agency has to be 25 horsepower. So. But it's all the infrastructure that comes along with that. So charging infrastructure, um, equity, that's another big one for us. So we're trying to target tree sales in hard to reach communities in the city. We're running out of places to plant trees in the park system. We, the only way that we're going to get a tree to can, canopy where it needs to be at that 18 <laughs> we got in the next one. The city's got an 18% target. We're at 16. The only way we're going to get there is to get trees planted on private property. So we want to, we're subsidizing the tree sale. We want to get trees in the community. 
Um, this summer over at Kensington, they did a tree sale. They just went out with people and got them signed up and got them trees, which was great. I also want to do that with uh, some plant sales. Uh, and then going into this whole total park shelf and standards, is we want to make sure we're maintaining neighborhood parks consistently across the community. Nobody should, you know, you shouldn't be in one part of the neighborhood or the community and it's one way and a different part of the community it's a completely different way. We want to have a standard that's the same across the community. And then through master plan, you want to make sure that there's equal access to all of our uh, sustainability of tree canopy increase at the city has got an 18% target. Um, we just found out that Boulder County is thinking about making the city go to a 24% target. What's nice is they've offered us a ton of incentives to make that happen, so uh, we're still working through that one. Uh, it's really good. Uh, water wise, how's that, that measured? What's that? that percentage measurement? Is that just top down well, overall area coverage? Yeah, <laughs> an average. Um, so the streets? It's everything. So, yeah, streets, parking lots, all that stuff we got to figure out. Rental properties. Rental properties. That, I, no, like that's where I'm looking at the equity is that <coughs> there are so much rental properties, and those people don't have, they can't plant a tree, even if they want a tree to shade. They can't. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so through the tree sale, we've got really, really expensive trees. That are We're trying to close that gap. Um, and then water wise, wise landscape conversions. So reduction of puddle water usage, reduce non-functional turf. That's where you're going to hear a lot of non-functional turf. So those are the turf spaces that just, it gets water and nobody uses it, right? Um, we've got a couple of demonstration gardens out there. The bottom right picture is over at Rogers Grove. Um, the community garden that was over there kind of defunct a couple years ago, so we converted that over to a water wise landscape garden for the community to kind of demonstrate different varieties that you can use and plant. Um, starting, it takes three to five years for that to really get nice and established for the plants to grow in. It's got a lot of weeds, but Rogers Grove's it's getting there. Um, so if you haven't been out there, I highly recommend going. So you program with the uh, in the years with the garden in the box, and that's just on top of the charts, too. Oh, yeah, so we worked with them and a lot of the plants that are out of Rogers Grove. So if you're, like, if you're curious, you're getting this garden in a box, you can go over to Rogers Grove and see what it's going to look like after a couple of years. That's it. Make sure you go over That's it. I have a question on the service works. Um, it works well with streets. It doesn't work well like in parks. It doesn't work. Because it because it always asks for an address and you're like bench here or something. <laughs> you're like, so you have to then convert that input. So there is an, an option in there where you can drop a pen. Yeah. If you do it from your phone. Right. Um, but yeah, usually I gotta figure out where it is. So service works has turned out to be a pain in my butt, to be honest. Because it'd be cool if you just pick the asset, right? Yeah, it was right. attached to your system. You'd be like, oh, this is the asset I'm talking about. It's already there. You don't have to. And he has them all mapped, right? So yeah, they're all mapped. Yeah, so there's yeah. something. Yeah. There's something. You should just be able to click on that bench and say, it's this bench. Well, like, I mean, right. the QR code thing. QR, QR reader, codes. you know, for broken sprinklers and <laughs> stolen bridges. I stole the So yeah, hopefully next year you'll start seeing some condition ratings come in and we'll be able to do heat mapping from that. So that's where you show, you know, you can do like the like Indian North Park is a D and it's got all, you know, all the assets and average. Do you anticipate that that condition rating will be available online for like public viewing? Yeah, it's much online. Because I won't be a sport anymore, so nice to want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it would be a good way to look at the equity to see where the deeds are. Yes. I was going to ask if you were going to overwrite with that vulnerability map. Yeah. yeah. The climate vulnerability map, we've got to see over there. There's another one that looks like. There's some like health data. Yeah, there's health data in there, right? There's a, there's a bunch of different data that we can look at. We want to Telephone has to be say, okay, let's not replace that playground with a playground. Let's do a, 
and we're doing a uh, workout thing over in uh, Rosenthal. And you said you put that service works in in March. March. Did you hear, did you hear anything back? I even went and prepped for this meeting. I even went and tried to ping the number, and it was just it drives me crazy. Nothing. I'm sorry, yeah. right. oh, yeah. crazy. It's always it's always in a loop on just not being able to respond, and the response may not be what people want to hear. But just yeah, somehow yeah, letting people know that we, yeah. that, yeah, we're going to answer it, I will get you to work on it. Yeah, no, I get it. And it's, it's a problem with our, it's not, it's yeah. the problem with the software. It's yeah. not the problem. The place where AIS stuff and scold me as I'm talking to the term, I used to work in big market research data. Yeah. And there was someone who now works at Place where AI, and I was like, oh, what do they do? I was like, oh, that's what they do. Um, so from survey, like, yeah. We have a really hard time to determining when we, we remove an asset. So polar hockey boards. If there's if nobody's using them, but we don't unless somebody's gonna sit out there and do the survey, right? Yeah. Or place or AI will be able to go and go, well look, nobody's using these amenities, exactly. so let's repurpose yeah. them to something else. Yeah. <laughs> I recommend it. <laughs> Good. Good. So I have a question on when you like that well, if, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, for, um, way back at the beginning of the slides, where you were saying, I'm mean, just thinking of your show, oh, Elizabeth. Oh, sorry, I don't know why I thought. Okay, so Elizabeth's saying, you know, the slide's down, and then you're like, well, that's slated for, like, like if one asset is down in something, does it have to wait until, like, the whole park renewal? Because, okay. It could it could be repaired unless the whole playground has to be repaired because you can't find the legos to fit the duplos. Yeah, so this goes into the decision making matrix too. Once you pull all those assets, you may see that okay, you've got all the lightning at Roosevelt needs to be done, plus all the right lighting around Dawson needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Make those into one project. Um, the playground decisions, you know, we're trying plan all the Flanders needs to be shelter needs to be replaced. What we're trying to do is get out of that process. So garden acres, the whole, all of garden acres need to be replaced. Over, everything needs to be replaced because they've been deferred for 50 years. So absolutely everything's failing. What we're trying to get out of is to get into a cycle where, so think of clover meadows. There's mm -hmm. certain assets in there that are going to fail at 20 years, some are going to fail at 50 years. What we're trying to get away from is that we're just doing a whole park 50 years from now. Let's do the playground in 20 years. Okay, okay, that's what yeah. they said. Because I was picturing, you know, well, the kid's going to be 14, but there'll be a slide. Great. You know. Yeah, there is that little bit of, like Kimber said, that if it's just a slide and the renewal is five year old, we're going to fix the slide. Yeah, if it's okay. the slide and the restroom and the bathroom and the lights and it's up for renewal next year, then it might be the decision that we're not going to fix the slide right now. Okay. Yeah, I remember my frustration being a Kanemoto Park neighbor, and then we had the flood and everything. I'm like, well, you know what? My kid in his formative years had four years he couldn't use his park. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't care about the turf. I just want him to be able to play. You know what I mean? Like that was so I, I can feel how you feel because, you know, when they're four, is when they're using the slide. But the goal, the goal of Total Park Health is there's no surprise that we, we're all here in the community. We make a conscious decision that, you know, maybe we don't have enough money this year, but next year we'll, we'll put it in there. And we'll know. Then we can communicate that too, right? When's Flanders getting our place? 2028. It looks like you did a really good job of building the data to then examine it and say, do we have the right inputs? We think we do. Okay. What are the decisions you can now make now that you have this box of data? Yeah, that's where we're at. We've got the data now. Now it's what decisions are we going to make? Are they layer that on global initiatives, equity, sustainability? All right. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. Thanks for all your work on yeah. that. Yeah. All right. Let's be credit cards. Credit cards, please. Yeah. Um, I'm Sue Ellen Ralph, and I'm a recreation area supervisor. Um, and primarily work with business and marketing. And today I'm going to talk to you about credit card fees and the changes that are coming soon. Now, the credit card fees that I'm going to talk about tonight, they only apply to credit card payments that are made through RecTrack and, and WebTrack, so at facilities or online registering for programs. Now, the ability to pass through a credit card fee to the customer 
It's dependent upon the credit card processor being used. Elevon is our current credit card processor, and they are not able to pass through credit card fees. Paytrack, the credit card processor that we're moving to, they can. Um, Recreation will continue to use Elevon for credit card charges that occur outside of RecTri. So the Union Reservoir kiosks, uh, mobile credit card readers, and a type of credit card reader that we call a two-step that operates outside of RecTrack. Any charges that happen on those devices will not pass through the credit card fees and will continue to pay those internally. Um, city priorities, there are three main reasons why we're changing credit card processors now. A big one is that the payment card industry standards, they're adopting a more complex and stringent security standard that goes into effect in March 2025. It's a big new deadline in the world of credit cards. Um, some of the changes have little costs associated with them. For example, we'll be moving all of your password requirements to 12 characters um, for both staff and for people, customers online. That one doesn't cost a lot. Other, other things cost a lot more, and they will become much more expensive and complicated if we continue to operate as we do now with staff at the staff at front desk. Now, for example, to be compliant with um, you're doing manual credit card entry. If you're someone's calling on the phone, to be compliant, you'll need to type the number in to a separate credit card reader that then sends the information back and forth. Um, our current readers with Elevon, they're not able to accept manual credit card entry in the reader itself. So right there, we're not compliant. So in order to be compliant, if we stay with Elevon, we have to use a costly workaround to make the computers more secure. And that starts going into um, a lot of expense. So if we move to pay track, um, we eliminate the computers from the security requirements completely because no credit card information ever goes onto the computer. Next one is by the, um, by the end of 2024, Recreation is on track to pay $139,000 in credit card fees with no revenues collected to offset it. Um, with a customer pass fee pass-through, the customers who use the credit cards will pay the fees associated with their purchases. And in anticipation of this change, um, the 2025 <coughs> Recreation budget line item that we use to pay credit card fees, well, it's been mostly eliminated. Um, they took cake of that money. And you know what percentage we're talking about? Ones that I've used are like four percent or something like that. percent. Was there any consideration to retain those funds within the recreation budget, rather than just eliminating? Uh, just to fund other things that need it was funding. Mm -hmm. Never funded. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't. I, I don't have a say in how the budget comes down like that. I will say that while that that amount was taken away, we did have an influx of funds um, into recreation in other areas that surpasses that amount. So, so I guess I'd really like to have seen that say. But. Um, when, you, when you say that though, aren't, aren't these fees already baked into the price? You don't, you don't assume. So you you can actually have the transactions. It's actually, it's it's actually illegal. We couldn't raise our fees three percent across the board in anticipation of that. And you know, the rest of our country that show me in the name list that does that. That's not it's not legal to do it that way. You, you could have the payment show the three percent fee at time of sale, but the system couldn't do that. So yeah. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um and then the final thing that has made this possible to happen now is that a non non Recreation department step forward to fund the costs associated with improving the infrastructure around the front desk workstations so that we can actually change the pay track. There are some changes that need to happen. <coughs> so, so, what is changing? Um, it's a 3% fee that will be added to the credit card sales. That 3% fee is paid directly to the credit card processor, PayTrack. None of that money 
is paid to the city, and the city doesn't pay that money back to the credit card processor. That a tariff line <coughs> item goes directly to the processor, stays with the processor, does all that stuff. Nothing ever hits a city GL. And um, on receipt, <coughs> communication with the customer, it's a separate line item. You may have seen something like that on other receipts that you've gotten, where you've got the cost of your sale, and it says a credit card processing fee, and then you're in the total. That's something you need to see, um, for full transparency with our stuff. And this will um, affect both online and facility transactions. And that is what allows it to be zero. Is it, we, don't, we don't collect that money. It goes directly past us. Yeah. Yeah. Never hits our GLs. Um, there are no fees for cash or check payments. Uh, so the customer does have a choice. Uh, online, we do an ACH, it's called an ACH, but it's a bank draft. Uh, that you can do at, at checkout time. That will not have a 3% fee. Um, and you can always go to our facilities and pay with cash or check. Debit is not an option? Debit is not a fee? No, I think it's a true like credit card. The ACH would be as if it came strictly out of the check. Yeah. Usually, usually you can get debit with lower fees, but because yeah. you're trying to get ACH, like, Treat it as credit or as a debit. Mm -hmm. You can run it as a visa or run it as a checking account transaction. But now most people have a debit card and don't care a checkbook without asking. Right. Yeah. Um, right now, it, it, my understanding of it will improve with, with our with our specific training as we get there. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, I'm getting ahead of it. Um, but my understanding right now is is sure. is down to the cash and the check. Does this at all play into, because we pay, something just moved to ACH instead of a credit card. You mm -hmm. the next slide, the utilities, so there's, there's various billing entities that are looking to your council. These billing programs, like, does it make sense to ev for everybody to use the same thing if they provide the individual services needed, or does it still make sense to have unique processors for utilities versus next slide versus all that? For, for recreation, we use our, our software that we use is RecTrack, and it only plays well with certain things. Um, so we've looked at that as a cost savings to put it all under one credit card processor, but then we also have the same problems with some other folks that their software talks with these banks right. and these right. ones with this. I get what you're saying. You're just saying, let's have the account here in the ACH in the, with the bank routing number and, the, and your account number, and then you say, oh, I want this to go to uh, next slide, I want this to go to uh, my uh, utility billing, and I would like this to pay for my kids' pass for the... Uh, yeah, I think, I think Loma has a, a uniquely high rate of municipal services for the person with municipalities. Yes. There's an opportunity to centralize that. I think, I don't want to speak out of turn, but with some of the new customer interface, CIS, CRM stuff, I think some of it's going to be consolidated. Six. I don't. I don't want to speak for Rex specifically. I want to buy Longmont credit card and just cover everything. Well, I just think that uh, what, uh, why probably things are not jumping to that. We the this is the last year that uh, uh, Jim Golden's there. So to throw that on top of him when it's like there it will be a new person that will bring in new ideas and maybe new, these concepts um, would be. Kind of something that uh, I can bring this up to council. Again, I think some of the customer base and stuff is going to be integrated cool. through a couple of efforts to cities. Yes, um, So, improved services and security will come with the pay tracks. One of them is that our new credit card readers will add tap and Apple Pay. So, we're excited about that. And um, this is a picture of a, one of the things that we'll be getting. And any manual credit card entry, you type it directly into the reader, not the computer. The computer is completely removed from the scope of um, security, which is a very cool thing. For us. And I'm sorry, can I ask yeah. a question? Mm -hmm. was, this, was this the other Union as well then? Union Gatehouse. And Union Gatehouse. Yes. So they will typically drive up and tap. Apple Pay tap. We are so not the kiosk. Not the kiosk. The kiosks stay on um, their um, little island. It's not the one. Wow. Yeah. 
With the, with the senior day, yeah, very much so. It was a lot yeah. of fun. I worked there on a senior day in May, and the number of people who were then mowing, the one person who had the credit card <laughs> that could actually make payment at the gatehouse was a, a very fun circle. <laughs> of, um, I just I need money. Okay. I'll pay that for you, so. Apple pie will be a good thing. Uh, so when is everything changing? Well, the timeline starts with the data port. And there, it has six steps. The data ports have to be installed first. And then they'll sign contracts, purchase credit card readers, get the staff training, prep the customers, and go live. Um, we've done as much front work as we can. The contracts are just ready to be signed. They've been approved by both people. We're just waiting for, for the time to sign it. The credit card readers, we make an order uh, on day one, and they arrive on day five. So they're in stock. They're ready to rock and roll. Staff training needs about four hours of back end work to consolidate or to how to reconcile these new credit card reports. And then um, we'll share this information with the customers and then we'll go live. <coughs> so, um, timeline is six to eight weeks after the data ports. Currently, our dev front desk workstations have one data port, and to go to pay tracks, each front desk workstation needs to have two data ports. Um, and upgrading those data ports at workstations. It's a large project that involves seven year-round and four seasonal sites, and each site presents its unique construction uh, challenges. Centennial Pool is a brick bumper. Uh, the Union Gatehouse is out in the boondocks, and it's this little um, The rec center actually is the one that um, Staff feels going to be the most complicated because they, they have to figure out how the data drops came in. Did they come in through the walls or under the ground or through the columns? And so they have some investigation work. Um, we saw last week that staff were at the Long Recreation Center trying to find that information out um, so they could get an idea of the scope of the project for that particular site. And then Recreation also heard that the projects were going out to bid. Uh, for contractors to come in and make those changes in, in October. Um, the city ETS staff has said that data ports will be completed at all the year-round sites by the end of the year. But they just don't have that you know, exactly dialed down. But once somebody starts doing anything at any site, we're going to start the clock on the timetable and start getting everything going. That should be happening soon. There, there's a back side to that. You only have funding from January to pay credit card fees. So we need to see this done and all of the money in January. We're ready to go. Did you, did you ever, was there messaging ever to the public to ask them to buy these credit cards? We, we, have, we haven't started to put out a message. We didn't do that in plan. But I, I, I had no idea it cost the city 3% of everything I was charging. I would have used a check or to pay a different way, right? Like, is there, is there messaging that this is costing the city $150,000 a year to so the public because they can use different ways to pay for it? It varies. Points we have, yeah. it, it just gets jumbled with everything, yeah. everything else. But, but uh, when I walked up to pay for, you know, the climbing wall or the pool, mm -hmm. uh, and I used my credit card, it's going to say that it's not uh, $6 or $7. It's going to say $7 plus 3%. That's where, to your point, I think we need to probably have people educated that that's been covered thus far for decades. I'd say. And it's grown significantly over the few years because I can remember it was like $68,000, you know, and then it became 93000 and it was 110000 and this year it's 139000 So it's not something that stayed steady, it's, it's really gone up quite a bit as people. Buy and do more things than just credit cards. Um, as far as getting the word out to folks, uh, we'll be looking at using our emails. We have a constant contact weekly e blast that goes out to 37,000 emails each week. Um, we'll have signs at the front desk to help educate folks about their options and um, similar to uh, utility billing. 
where you had to relink your credit cards. If anybody has installment annual passes with us, they'll have to relink all their credit cards at that time. Um, and maybe not do their credit card and do a bank. You know, bank thing could be cool. Um, we'll use uh, LamontColorado.gov to help get that information out. Um, we'll have it on Facebook and Instagram. And um, in the pop recreation brochure, uh, Senior Services has their uh, go that will have information in there as well, as long with the museum newsletters. So for payments that are, I mean, I can understand how it would work for payments <coughs> that you're doing online, where you could, instead of typing in your credit card number, you can type in your bank information. But for people like the councilman in this example, like if they're walking up to the ice rink or whatever, and they want to just pay for it, and they don't have cash, they have a credit card, what will they do? So how will they type in their bank information? They won't. They won't put in their bank information. ACH. So what will they do? They'll either they'll either pay their card or they'll they'll run to an ATM, get some cash, and come up with cash, or they'll pay their credit card fee. Or their credit card. So it's not really it's super be. convenient for walk up. I mean, I think it'll be fine online, but walk up will be challenging. Just because there's not that many people who carry cash or write checks. Yeah. So, so when, I just um, don't. <laughs> the one stop, oh, we do the permits downtown. They added their 3% credit card. They added their credit card fee. Uh, they were one of the first groups that went to that. They didn't see any reduction in credit card utilization. They actually saw a huge increase in credit card utilization. So uh, I, I'm not certain that you're going to see reduction. I think what you're going to see is a uptick in complaints. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not the it's not the fact that people will stop doing it, they just are going to see that. That's where I think the, the uh, communication part is probably first. If, if you've used um, a bank account to pay ACH through RevTrack for registering for activity, can you have your account get charged from a walk-up? Like, is that safe in the system? You can put a the, front, the people who work in front desk we just hired last week can't do this. Right. But if you go to the memorial building or a site, we you can say, here's fifty dollars. Can I put fifty dollars on my account? We say yes, you can put fifty dollars on your account, and then you can call from your own account. That's a great feature. Yeah, that's that. I guess we're not gonna cause problems. I just like I said, people don't carry cash in. I think a new um, finance director might recognize this is the as the wave of the future and to reduce the complaints, but I don't want to speak for whoever that is. I'll just say like anecdotally, I was in the service industry forever and tried people with credit card fees and not one person ever said I think a lot of people on the receipt and like they might be a bit like as a waitress giving people a thing and then tax, credit card fee, how much meal was, tips, I don't know if it's here or how that but certainly in Wisconsin. And I use uh, it's something that people, I don't think a lot of people take that much attention to, or pay, you know, once you if you're paying for a lot of our classes, maybe it adds up. Yeah, but I, I agree. You know, yeah. I think people find that I think people it's more people who are really just to have an option. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you, you have an identity with the city because you register for classes. You have a login for the site, but you go up to the ice rink and they're like, "Please pay me credit card." You're like, "Can you just charge me what I already used to pay here?" And yeah, I think we'll see enough tickets. People getting uh, the, the monthly or you know quarterly uh, uh, passes, which is cool because they they cost less on staff time. Mm -hmm. If you pay it once and you buy one that expires, it's it's good for us. Um. So, uh, in conclusion, in two thousand and twenty-five, we'll have the following situations in place. Uh, we'll be compliant with the newest PCI security standards. Um, our customers using credit cards will pay the associated credit card fees. Um, at our different sites, people can use TAP and Apple Pay and Google Wallet, different things like that. And we'll have a, a budget savings of over $120,000. Questions or additional questions? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think 
song that we went through. Okay, our last uh, business item is our November meeting date, which is supposed to be better today, I think. Was there a proposal or is it up to me to suggest yeah. something? It's, I think we're we're okay with I think anything that you guys may come up with. Um, you have the option to move it up, you can move it back. You don't you can skip a meeting, it's those things are all on the table. We don't no we don't have any restrictions on our end, so but we cannot be on the floor of my community on the right. Any opinions on board? I mean I think we our, our general thought is to avoid Tuesdays is and uh, and the body council, including myself, will be out at at uh, in T in Tampa Bay for a uh, for a uh, National League of Cities uh, conference. That week, and it's the 13th, 14th, and 15th. So, and then the following Monday is sometime I have like other meetings, so I wouldn't be able to probably. I just have to look and see when the golf. Golf seems to be a little hit and miss. I have to. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a swing. Jeff keeps talking about things in the agenda. Yeah. It's it's a it's a relatively light agenda. It doesn't it doesn't have time sensitive items on it. We'll be giving feedback at that time. So I'm not encouraging any particular way. I'm just saying. But we're going to draw names for secret Santa. Secret Santa. That's the important Santa guy. Yeah, uh, is everybody okay for the ninth? That's the next schedule we did. The ninth of December. December? Yeah. Just so we're not like. It's not yeah, I mean, if we, if we do skip, right. I would ask that we not skip. That's what I'm checking. Yeah. Assuming we can all make it to December, I think I'm just going to get nothing pressing. I can get it to December. Maybe do an email to get some negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> Some sort of ask so after that. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah, I'm sure. um, I'm available for the ninth. November's kind of a crazy time. Right. Really? So, um, so yeah. yeah. I, I move that we cancel the uh, plan on November 11th. Next part of the board meeting. I'll second that. All in favor? Yes. Very good. Uh, any items from the packet updates from any of us? Uh, phase 13, or section 13 of, um, of uh, the Greenway, mm -hmm. sounds like it's not going well. So it's just have to put some new domain for that. It's going as planned with that, yes. I think we're on track for this. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. Is this a mix for the sake? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is not going well, but in the not going well, it's going as planned. Okay. So I think we're on track to keep that moving. We have deadlines with those funds because of the grants that we're working on. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, that was giving my next part. Was yeah. does it impact the timelines? No, we we're still able through that process to continue with um, what we need to do to spend those those dollars that we have to see out. And Nino Gallo was awarded today, so. Yeah. Oh, nice! Yeah, yes. without without pickleball. Sweet. Which without pickleball? Sam's pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> well, sweet, pickleball. Did you <laughs> they they did reach Wayne and that group reached out to the the community there and they came up with a wavy track as the alternate. Oh, that will be that's awesome. fabulous! Yeah. Great, that's awesome. Thanks. So, so Playing pickleball courts. Yeah. <laughs> I have a pretty specific question that will tie to something we're going to bring to staff. Uh, maybe it's super specific, but the bank swallow survey or RSP. Uh, okay. Do you know if that's actually done by anything? It just says it's being conducted or something, and I'm very curious if they're actually bank swallow. There's bank swallow. There's a bank swallow oh, yeah. survey yeah. being conducted on um, the yeah. RSP. Yeah. 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 And I am curious. I'm I curious if there's actually bank swallow. No, that's where it holds. Yeah, they're, they're so they find you, anything during the, like it's being conducted now, right? Yeah, I'm just sorry, I was just sitting here reading emails from Jim Crick to yeah, someone yeah. else about that. So, um, I think Scott is working on that. I okay, don't have that essentially an update to the group, but um, I would be curious. 
I, it would be. Since they were well, they do they do slough off, and then right. you have to go back in and do that. And that's that's one of the things that we we knew too that that was kind of a transitory spot there was a for this habitat. But yeah. if you can get back to my that's staff right. goes, I can read through a couple of these emails that Jim was sending out. But I've been just curious. Give me email might ask the same question. <laughs> I've been curious for like three years. But I've been trying to answer. Yeah, over the last three years, they have been there. So. I've got a question about forestry. Um, it said forestry has available online a tree pruning removal planting permit. I, like, I just was unaware of this process. So that means the neighbor who's cutting down the cottonwood tree has to have a permit. Which, so, well, so can I, re I mean, it's a, it's kind of a big deal. It's a big, it's a big uh, nesting tree and it's also uh, not being done safely. It's pretty scary to watch it's right now. Owned. No, this is a privately owned somebody, a, a guy climbing up and chainsaw and tied so What was interesting is that the municipal code is that you must have a permit and there was never a permit. So the forestry team developed a permit process this year. Okay. So how do, what, what would someone do? I mean, it's like totally an unsafe situation to do. Like it's crazy. Like, and it's by winter. That's cutting down the tree. It's, cr it's crazy. Where's that? It's at thirteen oh two or thirteen twelve ninety million cottonwood. or something. Uh, it's cottonwood on the back. It's the, my next door neighbor. I'm at thirteen oh four South Terry Street. It's one hundred seventy. I'm going to check that. On privately owned property, the city code says you have to have a permit. It's a city owned. No, it's a city owned. If it's a city owned, so there are city owned trees that are maintained by the adjacent property owner, they must have a permit. Okay. If it's a private tree, though, you don't have to Okay, so it probably is, is a private tree. Okay. Yes. Okay, but still might be. Yeah, that's. It is, well, I'm, I'm curious is the it's a licensed contractor? No, it's not a licensed code. contractor. Uh, so they can't. Well, it's a like it's one hundred percent. This yeah. this guy yeah, gets yeah. free rent to to do stuff yeah. around the. I mean, it's, it's just it's terrifying to watch. Like my yeah. husband yeah. is like. How do you require a license contractor if there's no permit? Um, so in order to work in the city as a forester, you have to get a, um, a contract or a, a permit through planning department. We license about sixty contractors a year, but yeah, they, you've got to get licensed in the city. It's like sixty. I mean, I think it's probably different if you're just like Correct. trimming a branch or right. something, and you know that yeah, taking down a, a you know five story cottonwood tree. Yeah. There is no, there's, there's like grocery contractors out there that are definitely not licensed on this. So. Yeah. Um, code enforcement will contact yeah, forestry. Okay. Typically, yeah. a lot of the city forestry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like he was, he was. Saw it on it this evening as it's getting dark and just terrifying. <laughs> but, yeah. Other items from the packet? I think you have a forestry related item, but I was going to bring up their items from staff. Both from the board. The so, board. Yeah. Sorry. So he's being staff. I'm sorry. Always on the other side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. Uh, items from staff. I have good news. Nice. Yes. Um, we had a crane pick out our old chiller today and put in the new one. So it's yes. uh, really? years coming and um, two hours to do. <laughs> <laughs> wow. the results, so. That's exciting. It looks great. It's smaller. It fit right in the spot. So they're going to come back tomorrow and hook up the electrical and mechanical magic that they do. And then we have some prep work on our end. Okay. So, we were in a wildlife biologist talking about banks while I was here. There was a crane at Rackham. I know. That's a little bit of a crane. I'm glad that you changed the whole thing. Plus, I just did the joke. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
the work is. So, and again, I think we did, we held that up. You know, yeah. Steve has been the thing. Project just has so many just stops and goes, but we did want to look at, you know, not putting the on the neighborhood that we knew we didn't really have a voice to, you know, have some sort of activism that other communities do. So we went back out and worked with the neighborhood communities group and they had some meetings there. They presented several potential ideas and came back with the wavy little loop track. It's like a bike track? It's like a bike track, like the pump track. Yeah. yeah. Sounds great. But, you know, kids, older kids on bikes like to ride them too. And mm -hmm. I'll swim. run it. I'll be going to little mothers run it. Like out in yep. the branch. Yeah, exactly. Like me. So it's like a field start. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. like, like, you yeah, got down from the, oh, you're waiting yeah. on the base map. You can then start. Yep, it's yeah. 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 our yeah. Uh Staff, you good with that? Okay. Uh, from, from the board, I had one question I could start with. Um, what's the schedule for the lights at Roosevelt? I saw them on one night when I think they were installed. But they're not on other nights. And when does um, that start being on? Yeah. I've got with the kids that are excited and then they're like, it's dark. Like, yeah, it's it's sorry. Right. I don't have a good answer. Okay. Uh, um, it's so a switch I can hit somewhere. Well, we, we <laughs> did it for. Really yeah. That's right. why we did it. So yeah. Early. Got it. Our intent is to turn them on in November, to actually turn them on. But those guys get them set up and then sometimes they go on and if we don't intend them, they go on. Yeah. So it's actually something. Yeah. List of figuring out. That's our intent is not to run them. them. To run them, no. That's, I don't. I don't believe that. it's not a bill I see, but I don't believe it's expensive. To run them. But nevertheless, we we feel like doing it in November. We we'll, okay. try to start them in conjunction with ice. That's what we would like to do. It. So if you see them, think of it as a special trip. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. Sorry, can I ask a clarifying question? You don't see. You think Akiana just sent this to me like two hours ago. And the swallows were back this past year. Oh, the colony was smaller. Oh, cool. they but they are still working on what they can do with ways to. Is that great? Artificial stuff? It's always yeah. green. It's always green. Yeah. It's always green. Yeah. It's always green. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah, recreation, that's a piece that, we, again, that went through the whole SES evaluations on water versus power versus off-gassing versus life cycle, all those pieces. It was kind of a launch, but recreation really felt we could help timber really give um, sandstone a rest on some of those. Yeah, so we're formulating all sorts of uh, as far as use out there, use of sandstone, trying to balance the two, trying to... to Cycle the sandstone for the first time. Would be amazing. Yeah. Well, for Street, yeah. 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 No, no, you go first. Okay. Actually, I have a couple questions. Um, one, I noticed just in looking through the price rank info, um, there was a note that said that rec center passes would not be accepted for a drop in or stick and vote. So does that mean there's going to be an extra charge for people that are coming to like drop in and stick and fuck? Because part of the reason I have a back center class is so I don't have to pay extra for stuff like that. And now with this credit card system, it's going to be even harder if people are coming in at like eight in the morning to do stick and fuck. And it's not going to be harder. They just there will be a slight. Well, but they'll have to be paying um, where they weren't paying previously. I'm, I'm not aware of that. So, so tell me okay. again what it says. It says, right Rec Center passes will not be accepted for a drop-in and stick and fuck. So, which means they are accepted for ice skating. But I don't know why they would charge for a drop-in and stick and fuck. I mean, you have, they require reservations, which to control the numbers. Uh, I don't have an answer. So, you have to just let me know. I will. That would be great. I'll, I'll send that answer out to talk about that. And then my other question was about um, just an update on the status of that. I think it's called the Basin Reservoir that was drained for so long. And then, you know, it's the one that's on so um, Nelson thin. Road. So you feel like Nelson? Yeah. yeah. And then, then, like, all the weeds grew up. And I think I asked about it once before, and I think there was, like, there was some repair happening. And now there's some water in it. 
Isn't that unincorporated water property? So, yeah, so yeah, we acquired it with yeah. a focus, okay. focus space and water, acquired that property, you know, in that area. I mean, this is a weird thing. I, I've been out there, I didn't notice that, because that's a place we had actually a cement truck overturned at that spot, and we had to do a mm -hmm. cleanup out there, remember? Yeah. Yeah. It was drained for months, and then, like, while it was drained, like, tons of weeds were left. On follow-up. And now there's a little bit of water in it, again, but tons of weeds. And it was that you're so. talking about, and it's out there for a, another reason, right? So those guys been yeah. apart. It's like they didn't look at the water to look at the cement. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> just a question. Has anybody going to the park opening in the floor? Mm -hmm. One second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember that. I looked at Clover, Clover Meadows. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The we went up to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The tour, right? So now that's exciting. Okay. I've been trying to. So, Trish and Tati had to do a great job trying to put together, or at least uh, put together like, a little event for. Oh, yeah, so one oh, cute track. Yeah, yes, exactly. yeah. So I got an email invitation to. Yeah, they had the apple apple orchard there, so they're doing an yeah. apple theme oh, sort of. That's fun. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm planning on trying to swing by. I'm just curious. So. Um, I know this is, we aren't really open for suggestions on things we want to hear about, but it's still in my third meeting and when it was asked about last time, I just didn't totally have any ideas, but I do have a couple of things sometime in the next short while. Um, you brought up forestry. I would love, I don't know if you guys have ever had like a forestry update at this body or have had one recently, but I'd be really interested to learn more about um, whatever falls in the purview of parks, reference, you know, open space. Um, how are forestry dollars being spent? How many trees are we maintaining? How many trees are planting? How many trees would be sold? What kind of emerald ash borer situation are we seeing? Um, just, I have like a secret little insight to the forestry world here, and I'd be interested to hear um, from kind of this side of the table. Um, I'm going to be trying to say particularly where some of the forestry dollars go. There's quite a lot of money in that fund, um, or can be. Um, and then, mitigation fund. True mitigation fund. I don't want to get into the deep, but yeah, I've always been a little curious so, about. Yeah, I, yeah, Brett could be right. Yeah, so I, I would invite Brett to come uh, here sometime in 2025. They, they did a great job doing that. Yeah. It'd be great. Brett, 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 total, total forestry management. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. We just named it. Yeah. So I would love, I just, I don't know if anybody else is interested, but I'm interested in having this. It's needle you. I mean, it depends on what part of forestry, if you're talking about urban forestry, or if you're talking about like all of the like welfare mitigation. So that would have that be happening like a front row in the open space. Yeah, price of heat. Which one are you interested in? More the city, urban, yeah. city, fit, forest, even what you brought up. Do you, do you need a permit? No, you don't need a permit. I know, again, kind of maybe there's discussion about what falls in the purview of this board. I, mean, I wasn't here for this. Yeah, but I, I think yeah, it was good to touch on 18 Yeah, we've made some yeah, 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 studies absolutely. in that future yeah. mitigation too. Uh, sorry, the last year, if a um, if street project is not in a bunch of trees. There's a tree mitigation fund for the yeah. trees. So glad to hear that. Yeah. So, because um, <laughs> there is, there was a, yeah. it was, it was a, a good pot of money. There was a good pot of money there. Um, and reforestation other efforts, which happened. We do this there. one that to offset the tree sale this year. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, just like, I just suggest general would be interested to hear from Brett. Um, and then similarly, uh, talk about bird nesting with the swallows. Um, I don't know when the right season is, so I think some nesting seasons just end even in December or something. For most, or, for most of the like, like the protected birds, isn't it like August through December? Is the oh, yeah, the like the nesting yeah, season, yeah. So something that I'm after nesting season ends, or just in general, I'd be interested in maybe to get like a habitat report mm -hmm. for what's going on in the city, how many birds do we see, what do the volunteers see, um, related to that, like any kind of ecosystem update, you know, hey, our, our birds and mammals, do you want? Yeah, the mammals, and even like I know there's like how, like, what. Volunteers that check on the quality of the lakes, like just kind of an ecosystem. You know, uh, mammals are, I'd be really interested in it. Um, just how many, you know, how many birds are found in the city this year? Did we have to do mitigation after all of them? Did, you know, did nest do well or did they fail? Do, do you, do, have you been seeing like Cornell's new technology that tells you how many birds are flying over your house any night? No. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, I'll pull it's crazy. it up. It is crazy. It's one, one, <laughs> one night, Boulder County has 1,307,000 birds fly over in one night. That's crazy. crazy. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 They they were not. It was earlier than you fly, but That's it, and it and it tells you the species. It is That's crazy. crazy. I'll show you. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't get right. sometime yeah. in twenty twenty five. If we're looking for a topic, um, yeah, so some of his friend Jim and Scott in or yeah, 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 just said love to it. Great. My personal interest in the yeah. Great. I have one more two things so one of them is a kudos to like the, the all the programs working together there was a big fish kill i don't know if any of you heard of it there's a big fish kill um in okay. left hand and um one of my friends who's uh like some sort of environmental doctorate at colorado or university of colorado she's like so crazy smart she calls me she's like frantic who do i call and i'm like Blah. And I'm like thinking everybody's gonna like tamp it down, and that was not the case at all. And I got out there because I I actually just thought everybody was gonna kind of ignore it, and so I got out there with water testing. But as soon as I got out of work, I'm like grabbing all the water testing equipment. I go out, and there's city, there's Colorado Parks and what I mean, there's so many different agencies working together, and I was really really pleased with the response and how seriously. People took that, and it made me really happy and have a lot more confidence in my government. And it's like I kind of wanted to throw that out in like some newspaper or somewhere when people are complaining about the government. And it's like this was your government protecting you. So, I would give to this too. That was really our water wastewater guys because they have all the chemical. I mean, our wildlife staff knows that's dead fish, and here's you know the species it is. And, um, but they don't know what's causing it. So it really was a great coordination between CPW and our water wastewater guys. Yeah. There was also field staff who was the fish in the creek. And they, yeah. all, they reported it in through our team. They're like, they were seeing a fish kill off on left hand. And I thought we were going to walk in the lake. I'm like, hey, what's going on with that left hand? And he knew there was an issue. So. Yeah, so there was um, in the neighborhood there, there was an inlet from the neighborhood. And they tested it at 0.1% chlorine, which is humongous, and so I don't know what the outcome is of who they track, what they tracked right. it down to, and I like I hope if it was corporate, they pay, and I hope if it was private, they now know that their actions have consequences. Like some drain up the pool or something? Maybe. Yeah. It was, I mean, I and you saw it, like a fish like yeah. this. The and amount fish you would need to, like, like, to suck it It was a thousand fish killed. That's and, I mean, like this. I mean, I have pictures of the buckets. It was crazy. I kind of want to, I just didn't have time to like get that into the media because I thought it would be interesting for the media to see that. So that was a compliment. And then I also would like to see, especially we're tying in with the birds and that migration, and then also so many astro, like astro, astronomy events. I can't even say the big word. Um, I'd like to see the city have dark sky nights. I like to see um, we've had aurora borealis that nobody can see. We've had we have a comet nobody can see. We have um, the Perseid meteor shower that I would love for us to be able to go to Sandstone Ranch. The last time I went to Sandstone to look at it, the police questioned me and a couple you know some high schoolers that I had with me and things like that. I'd like to see some more dark sky and just put it out there because. So it hurts, but it you've actually asked that before, and that's something yeah. beyond us, and that's, that's something constantly. Yeah, but I mean, there's so many people involved and stuff. Yeah. But the piece, of, if if we have places like Sandstone and the school groups and teachers, and they, I don't think we have a problem. We've opened up for astronomers and stuff to come out yeah. there, so we can do a permitting yeah, system. Yeah. So yeah. we can definitely do permitting for that. The bigger picture, I'm going to push it down. Well, I, I yeah. think the bigger picture is is uh, is doing it like uh, when I first heard you say that. Uh, I thought, oh, that could be problematic because if once told everybody to do this, it would be uh, it would be someone's excuse for doing some sort of nefarious acts. And uh, but if we just tell, had it at like uh, Sandstone or maybe uh, Garden Acres or someone like that, and it was very specific, then we probably could uh, have the uh, police notification and that and, and make something like that happen. It's just uh, I was thinking bigger than that. Just say, so like, I mean, right, that would right, be right, nice. I'm thinking city. What I mean, big cities are. I mean, this is real deal. Cities are doing this. Crime doesn't really. I mean, 
it's a kind of a myth that white is such a crime deterrent. White gives a lot of criminals uh, a way to see the crime that they're doing. Um, like that, like when you, well, when you look at the when we when the Marshall fire occurred, uh, there were people that complained to the city about why wasn't Longman there. Longman was there, but we could never announce that because uh, the the fact that uh, uh, if we did. And we did have a couple of uh, uh, situations where uh, crime did occur because people did figure out that we had the bulk of our fire and police over helping with that situation. But that was it. Now, you know, I don't know the statistical data. I'd have to talk to, to Zach, uh, uh, our chief of secure, uh, safety and everything, and see what he knows about that. He probably has more statistical data that maybe support what you're talking about. We can figure that out. Uh, I just don't, you know, it's, it's got to be something where, like, you know, when you when you do that, is it something that we know is going to happen at kind of a general time? Uh, like a well, you know, and like the, the, the perseids are going to be, and you do know some basics about when huge bird migrations are, but I mean, cities are doing that. Big cities are turning up the lights. It's happening. And we can, if we're on the forefront of some stuff, we can be in the forefront of this. I and just I'll just never, feed it out. No, I, 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 like, then that's why I'm bringing it up, is that you have to start, start feeding people that kind of information until they get a taste of it. That's all. Yeah, I think I've been trying to suggest adding a dark sky ordinance to the building process for commercial buildings. That would be back to yeah. an existing county and city of Boulder and not my own knowledge. Yes. There's one. And it has been integrated. So there is not, it's not. The, the dark skies initiative was integrated in this whole code, mm -hmm. in the building code. So there, you can't find anywhere that's like the dark sky initiative yeah. because of yeah, this right to you, right? Yeah. He took the whatever was in the dark sky initiative and put it in the. But it so doesn't. It doesn't retrograde. Yeah, it doesn't retrograde. Yeah. It's not going retro, but it had like yeah, I do know some because I was at a meeting where they said, but it's not retrograde. You yes. still get in trouble if you block off your lights. Yeah, that came up with the lights out at Dry Creek. Not Dry. Uh, yeah, Dry Creek. Yeah. Um, it was like, well, it's a part of dark sky initiative. Yeah. Our guys mission was this. And you're doing a great job. And so we're doing a great job. Let's like let's keep going. Let's keep going. Anybody else? Okay. Motion to adjourn. I'm ready to adjourn. Thank you all. Favor.